Welcome to Introduction to Criminal Litigation. This lesson has four parts. An overview of criminal litigation is part one. Sources of the law and rules guiding Nigerian criminal litigation is part two. Types of criminal courts is part three. Key concepts to bear in mind is part four. We hope that you enjoy this class. Slide 2 contains a high level overview of what we are going to be considering. Part 1 is introduction or an overview of criminal litigation. And part 2 is sources of the law or rules guiding Nigerian criminal litigation. This slide shows us part 3 types of courts and part four key concepts to bear in mind let's take a look at the first part an overview of criminal litigation what is criminal litigation all about. To answer that question, we will attempt to define the term criminal litigation and the opposite term civil litigation. This will be followed by comparing and contrasting the two. Let's dive right in. What criminal litigation is all about? Criminal litigation is the procedural law governing court trials of accused persons, that is, criminal trials. Criminal law is a substantive law that defines crimes and punishments. Criminal litigation is the set of procedures for making, administering, and enforcing criminal law. Criminal litigation comprises the rules by which our courts hear and determine what happens in criminal proceedings. And this would include how the rules of evidence apply in trials of an accused person or accused persons. Civil litigation, on the other hand, is a procedural law governing court trials of persons who may have failed in their duties or rights or obligations towards another. That is civil trials. Civil litigation, civil law is thus the substantive law that defines rights and responsibilities. While civil litigation is the set of processes for making, administering, and enforcing civil law. By the way, in common law legal systems such as Nigeria, all non-criminal law is civil law. Civil litigation therefore comprises the rules by which our courts hear and determine what happens in criminal, in civil proceedings, sorry to say, where the rights, duties, and obligations of persons, be they natural or legal, amongst themselves, is alleged to have been trampled upon, denied, or breached and should the court establish the same, the court may award the injured party compensation for the injury so established. Anyone can institute a civil suit. However, only a public official, known as a prosecutor, can institute a criminal trial against an individual alleged to have committed a crime or crimes. In doing so, the prosecutor is a representative of the government. It is the duty of the prosecutor to attempt to establish that the accused committed the alleged offense beyond all reasonable doubt, unlike in civil cases where the plaintiff needs a preponderance of evidence, that is, that on a balance of probabilities, the position of the plaintiff is more likely to be the true version of events than that of the defendant. In summary then, Criminal litigation involves prosecution by the state or federal government of a defendant charged with a crime 
Now, civil litigation involves matters between individuals, be they natural or legal, against each other for matters such as thoughts, contract disputes, fundamental human rights violations, to mention but a few. Criminal litigation is driven by the idea of punishment, while civil litigation is driven by the idea of correcting a wrong and of compensating the claimant for his loss. Welcome to the scope of the criminal litigation course. This is just a highlight, not a deep dive. The range of issues that criminal litigation addresses, or this criminal litigation course addresses, include how to lay complaints before a law enforcement agent such as the police, the police officer, how law enforcement should investigate a criminal complaint, how law enforcement should conduct searches of suspects, how law enforcement should conduct arrests of suspects, including who can arrest suspects, how law enforcement should interview a suspect, how law enforcement should institute criminal proceedings, how law enforcement should draft charges, conditions for granting bail to suspects pending trial, the constitutional safeguards to ensure fair trial of a defendant, how a criminal court should convict and sentence a defendant, how judges should deliver judgments, how convicted criminals can appeal verdicts that they consider unjust. Now that we have, we are done building a bird's eye view of our criminal litigation course. Let's do a deep dive by going through the entire curriculum. The first part of the course is entitled Introduction to Criminal Litigation and we will treat an overview of the criminal litigation course sources of the law and rules guiding criminal proceedings, types, settings, settings and settings of criminal courts. In part, we will treat jurisdiction and venue of courts of criminal jurisdiction. We will take jurisdiction separately and venue separately. We will apply this concept to Nigerian courts and we also apply it to the International Criminal Court. However, we will be concerned mainly with the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. We will address searches, arrests and constitutional rights. And we will travel down such topics like authority for searches and arrests, execution of searches and arrests, admissibility of materials, procedure for challenging searches and arrests, constitutional safeguards relating to these procedures. Then we will treat pre-trial investigation and police interviews, how police stations should conduct interviews, statement forms to be filled at the police station, and police bail. Legal representation on the rights of suspects at police stations. Issues in police investigation and admissibility such as alibi, confession, judges' rules, identity of suspects, expert opinion, and handling of exhibits. 
in part 5, we will deal with the institution of criminal proceedings. We will consider authorities that can initiate the institution of criminal proceedings, such as the Attorney General, the DPP, other officers, the police, other prosecuting authorities such as Customs, ICPC, EFCC, SSS or TSS, as well as private persons. We will consider the mode and scope of institution of criminal proceedings by looking at information, charge, and complaints. In part 6, we will take a look at charges, the forms, the contents, the rules of drafting charges, amendment of, char amendment of charges, procedure after amendment, sample charges, there will be a practical exercise involving the drafting of charges. You look at bail pending trial, the types, the scope, the consequences of bail, the procedure for application, and there will be a practical exercise involving the drafting of motions, summons, and affidavits. In part 8, you will pay attention to constitutional safeguards to ensure fair trial of an accused person. You will treat such rights as the right to counsel, the right to silence, access to defendants in custody, information of the crime alleged to have been committed, the provision of an interpreter, fair, fair hearing versus the presumption of innocence, That offences must be known to the law, the rule against double jeopardy, the right to examine witness called by the prosecution, right against trial upon interactive legislation, right against trial for an offence for which the accused has already been pardoned. We will also take a look at trial. In fact, trial is such a big the major part of this course that is broken into four parts. The first part is attendance of parties and arraignments. We will treat the presence of the accused, complainants, witnesses, and counsel in court, processes to compel the attendance of the accused, summons, arrests, and warrants, dispensing with the presence of the accused, as well as the presence of the complainant. We will also take a look at the duties and roles of the registrar, counsel and the judge in criminal trials, arraignment, recording of plea, options open to an accused upon arraignment. Trial. You will take a look at trial preparation, the rules of evidence as the burden and standard of proof, competence and compatibility of witnesses, how to develop a case theory or trial plan, subpoenas and witness summons, types, issues, and the use, how to prepare witnesses for trial, opening address, and delivery. Entitled Examination of Witnesses, we'll take a look at what is examination in chief, what is cross examination, what is re examination, what purpose do examinations serve in a trial, what questions are not allowed in examination in chief, admissibility of documentary evidence such as confessional statements, expert evidence, and Police reports, admissibility of PSA evidence, the procedure for refreshing memory, and the procedure for dealing with hostile witnesses. Part of trial, that's part four, presentation of the case for the defense. We will treat options available to an accused person at the close of the case for the prosecution, no case submission and when it is made. 
resting case on the prosecution's case, opening address for the defense, procedure for visit to a locus inco, application of the ex improviso rule, final addresses for the parties, In part 13, you will treat judgment and sentencing. The contents, the type, the form and the delivery of judgments, the effect of failure to comply with section 308 of the Administration of Criminal Justice Act, time limit to deliver judgments, the effect of failure to deliver within the time set by the Constitution. Conviction, allocutus, desirability and perspectives, sentence, the power of a court to take other offenses into consideration, types of punishment, the death sentence, the form of pronouncing death sentence, the effect of failure to comply with the form, exceptions to death sentence, the prerogative of mercy, and rest to relative justice. Under the heading appeals, we will consider the right of appeal, who can appeal, where to file appeals, time limit for appeals, type of appeal, constitution of the court to hear appeal, difference between appeal and case stated, Appeal from magistrate courts to high courts, the time limit to file notice, the grounds upon which the prosecution may appeal, and the grounds upon which the accused may. We we'll also look at bail pending review, the power of judicial review, appeal from high court to the court of appeal using subtopics such as when the appeal may lie as of right and when the appeal may lie with leave, notice, compilation of records, filing of briefs of arguments, hearing, orders that the court can make after hearing, appeal from the court of appeal to the Supreme Court using such subtopics as when appeal may lie as of right when appeal may lie with leave, notice, compilation of records, filing of briefs of argument, hearing, orders that the court can make after security to prosecute appeal, abatement of appeal, abandonment of appeal, Effect of wrongful admission or rejection of evidence, mistrial or miscarriage of justice, circumstances under which a trial will be ordered by an appellate court. Having concluded part one, let's now take on part two sources of the law and rules guiding Nigerian criminal litigation. We will cover a total of four subtopics. First, an overview of the sources. Second, what laws or rules operate in various parts of Nigeria. Third, what laws or rules operate in various courts in Nigeria. And finally, there is also a take-home assignment involving comparing and contrasting the laws and rules operating in various courts in Nigeria. So the rules or laws applicable depend on the following factors. First, the type of court. Is it a magistrate court? Is it a state high court? 
is it the Federal High Court or is it the Court of Appeal? And finally, is it the Supreme Court? The second factor is whether or not the state has domesticated the ACJA. And if it has not, then whether the state is in Northern Nigeria or Southern Nigeria. Third, whether or not a lacuna exists in the law applicable to a particular jurisdiction and the express provisions of the law for such circumstances. So on the screen is an overview of the three types of sources, basically a high level map of the three types of sources we will be considering. And when we say principal sources, we mean they are called principal sources because these laws are wholly focused on criminal litigation. And they include the Administration of Criminal Justice Act, the Administration of Criminal Justice Law, Criminal Procedure Code Law, and Criminal Procedure Laws. When we say secondary sources, these are called secondary sources because although they may contain provisions on criminal litigation, that is not the sole focus of the legislation. And they include the 1999 Constitution of Nigeria as amended, the Criminal Code Act of Laws, the Penal Code Act of Laws, and the Evidence Act. And finally, we have the teacher resource, and that simply means, or they're called teacher resource because they are foreign or alien to the Nigerian legal system. And what we call teacher resource is basically English procedure and practice. Let's take the first principal source, the ACJA. ACJA is short for the Administration of Criminal Justice Act of 2015. Before the ACJA came into force, the major procedural criminal law for Nigeria was contained in either the Criminal Procedure Act, the CPA, or the Criminal Procedure Code, the CPC. The legislation, the legislation in force in Nigeria depended on whether a Nigerian state belonged to Nigeria's northern or southern region. For northern Nigerian states, the CPC held sway. For Southern Nigerian states, the CPA reigned supreme. Since 2015, the principal statute applicable to the High Court of the FCT, all other federal courts, and any state High Court that tries a federal offense is the ACJA. Please see Section 2, Subsection 1 of the ACJA. J -A. Let's take the second principle source, the ACJL. ACJL is short for Administration of Criminal Justice Law. If a state domesticates the ACJA, it becomes known as the ACJL. The list of states that have done this is 24 as at the last count out of Nigeria's 36 states. And that number is accurate as at December 20th, 2019. The list of states that have passed the ACJL are as follows. Anambra State, 2010. Cross River State, 2017. Delta State 2017, Ikiti State 2014, Enugu State 2017, Kogi State 2017, Lagos State initially in 2007 and repealed and amended in 2011, Ondo State 2016, Oyo State 2017, Katuna State 2017, River State 2016, Akwaibum State 2017, Edo State 2018, Ogun State 2018, Plateau State 2018, Usun State 2018, Kwara State 2018, Adamawa State 2018, Bayelsa State 2019, Kano State 2019, Jigawa State 2019, 
Abia State 2017, Benue State 2019, Nasarawa State 2019. Let's take the third principal source, the CPCL. CPCL is short for Criminal Procedure Code Law. The history of a criminal procedure code in northern Nigeria can be traced to the then Chief Justice of Nigeria, H. C. Golan's Criminal Procedure Proclamation of 1903, which was based on the Gold Coast Criminal Procedure Ordinance of 1876. Following amalgamation of northern and southern Nigeria, Governor General Lord Lugard sought to unify the criminal procedure laws of both regions through a consolidating ordinance known as the Nigerian Criminal Procedure Ordinance of 1914. So for a period of time, all of Nigeria had one criminal procedure law until subsequently, the Criminal Procedure Code was passed into law by the Northern Regional Government in 1963. Northern states later domesticated it. Hence, we have CPCL at the state level. This had the effect of making the CPCL the principal criminal procedural law applicable in those territories until the ACJA was domesticated to become the ACJL in those states. States which still use the CPCL include Bauchi, which is in the process of domesticating the ACJL, Sukoto, KB, Niger, Zamfara, Katsina, Yube, Boronu, Gombe, and Taraba states. Let's take the fourth principal source, the CPL. CPL is short for Criminal Procedure Law. The history of a criminal procedure law in southern Nigeria can be traced to the Gold Coast Criminal Procedure Ordinance of 1876, which was originally enacted when Lagos was part of the colony of the Gold Coast. Following amalgamation of northern and southern Nigeria, Governor General Lord Lugard sought to unify the criminal procedure laws of both regions through a consolidating ordinance known as the Nigerian Criminal Procedure Ordinance of 1914. This law was subsequently revised and this led to the passage of the Criminal Procedure Act in 1945 that applied to all of Nigeria. However, due to its incompatibility with the mode of life and religion of Northern Nigeria, in 1963, its scope of application was restricted to Southern Nigeria. Southern Nigerian states then domesticated it so that it became the CPL, that's Criminal Procedure Law, instead of CPA, Criminal Procedure Act, which applies at the federal level. By virtue of Section 33 of the Federal High Court Act, the CPA used to apply to proceedings at the Federal High Court and military court martials. But see Section 493 of the ACJA, which repealed the CPA, making the ACJA the current procedural criminal legislation in force at the Federal High Court and indeed all federal courts. We are now done with our consideration of prime or principal sources. We will now be taking on secondary sources. Recall that they are called secondary sources because although they may contain provisions on criminal litigation, that is not the sole focus of those legislation. The first secondary source is the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as amended. It feels rather strange that the Constitution, which is the ground norm or rule that serves as the foundation of the legal system, can be called a secondary source of law. That notwithstanding, the Constitution has a number of provisions that deal with criminal litigation, including but not limited, limited to the Supremacy Clause of Section 1, Subsection 1 and 3, the Right to Life in Section 33, the Right to Personal Liberty in Section 35, the Right to Fair Hearing in Section 36, Nolle Prosecute 
in sections 174 subsection 1 and section 211 subsection 1. The prerogative of mercy in sections 175 subsection 1 and 212 subsection 1 are the jurisdiction of criminal courts as contained in chapter 7. Our second secondary source is Criminal Code Act or Laws. Known as the Criminal Code Act, Cap 38 of the Laws of the Federation 2004 and its state level equivalent, known as the Criminal Code Laws of their respective states. This Act or Law, as the case may be, constitutes Southern Nigeria's substantive criminal law that defines crimes and punishments. It basically criminalizes offenses considered to be improper conduct in southern Nigeria. Our next secondary source is the Penal Code Act or Laws. This is northern Nigeria's equivalent of the Criminal Code Act or Laws. The Penal Code Act in use in northern Nigeria was enacted in 1959, but came into effect in 1960 and was based on the Penal Code of the Sudan, which was enacted in 1899, which in turn was based on the Indian Penal Code drafted by Lord Macaulay between 1833 and 1837, but came into force in 1860. Until then, substantive criminal law in Northern Nigeria was based on the Nigerian Criminal Code of 1916, promulgated by Lord Lugard following the amalgamation. The Penal Code criminalizes offenses considered to be improper conduct in Northern Nigeria. Our next secondary source is the Evidence Act. The law of evidence is relevant to criminal litigation because it governs how both sides of the divide, that's the prosecution and the defense, will prove the facts they intend to rely on in the course of the criminal proceedings. It deals with the quantity, quality, and even the type of proof necessary to establish one's version of events in court. With respect to criminal litigation, the standard of evidence required of the prosecution is evidence beyond all reasonable doubt, unlike in civil litigation where the standard of evidence required of a claimant to succeed, which is a preponderance of evidence. Under this classification scheme would include the following secondary enactments. The Police Act, the Armed Forces Act, the Armed Forces Disciplinary Proceedings Special Provisions Act, the Coroner's Act and Coroner's Laws of the respective states, Children and Young Persons Act and Laws of the respective states, the Supreme Court Act, Supreme Court Rules, Court of Appeal Act, Court of Appeal Rules, Federal High Court Act, Federal High Court Rules, High Court Laws, Magistrate Court Law, the Independent Fraud Practices and Other Related Offenses Act, Advanced Fee Fraud and Other Fraud Related Offenses Act, Dishonor Check Offense Act, Recovery of Public Property Special Provisions Act, Firearms Act, Robbery and Firearms Special Provisions Act, Public Order Act, Terrorism Prevention Act, Money Laundering Prohibition Act, Money Laundering Prohibition Amendment Act, Cyber Crimes Prohibition and Prevention Act. That brings us to the end of our consideration of secondary sources. We are now going to begin our consideration of what is known as tertiary sources. And in one word, a tertiary source is the English procedure and practice, that is foreign to Nigerian law. If Nigerian criminal procedure laws fail to make provision for the procedure for handling a certain type of criminal matter, or if Nigerian criminal procedure laws make provision for the procedure for handling a certain type of criminal matter, but fail to state the conditions for applying such provisions, then scenario one. 
if the jurisdiction is a southern Nigerian state that has not domesticated the ACJA, then Section 363 of the CPL shall apply, which states that the procedure and practice for the time being in force of the High Court of Justice in England in criminal trials shall apply to trials in the High Court in so far as this Act has not specifically made provision therefore. Scenario 2. If the jurisdiction is Lagos, then Section 266 of the ACJL applies which states that the court shall adopt such practice, sorry, the court shall adopt such procedure as will, in its view, do substantial justice between the parties concerned. The third scenario, if the jurisdiction is the FCT or federal courts, wherever situated, then section 492 subsection 3 of the ACJ applies, which states, where there are no express provisions in this act, the court may apply any procedure that will meet the justice of the case. Scenario 4. If the jurisdiction is a northern Nigerian state that has not domesticated the ACJA, then the CPCL applies. And Section 35 of the High Court Laws of Northern Nigeria indicates that the reception of and reliance on English rules of practice and procedure is expressly forbidden. In practice, Northern courts will do what it determines will constitute substantial justice to the parties involved. So, an alternative classification scheme is hereby proposed. In this classification scheme, there are basically two types of law. There is substantive law and there is procedural law. Substantive criminal law defines crimes and punishments. Procedural criminal law is the set of procedures for making criminal law via precedents, administering criminal law as codified in statutes, as well as enforcing criminal law. To better understand this classification scheme, let's study the history of criminal legislation in Nigeria. Basically, the English handed over to Nigeria two kinds of criminal legislation. Substantive criminal legislation and procedural criminal legislation. Let's take a look at the substantive criminal legislation first. First of all, we have the Criminal Code of Northern Nigeria of 1904 for the North. Unfortunately, there was no equivalent for the South. Not until following amalgamation, when Lord Lugar passed into law the Nigerian Criminal Code of 1916 for all of Nigeria, that's both the Northern Nigeria and Southern Nigeria. Following independence, we then have the Northern Nigerian Penal Code of 1960 or the Penal Code for short, and then South Nigeria had the Criminal Code Act. We are now done with substantive um, criminal legislation. Moving on to the procedural criminal legislation. It all began with the Criminal Procedure Ordinance of 1876, which was enacted in 1903 in the South and H.C. Golan's Criminal Procedure Proclamation of 1903 in the North. Following the amalgamation, we had a consolidating ordinance known as the Nigerian Criminal Procedure Ordinance of 1914. Subsequently, Northern Nigeria adopted the Criminal Procedure Code, while Southern Nigeria went with the Criminal Procedure Act. Now we have the ACJA for all of Nigeria at the federal level, 
and for the FCT and the ACGL at the state level for states that have domesticated the federal legislation. However, since not all states have domesticated it, some states still have procedural laws based off uh, and what I mean by based off is that those laws are reenactments of the CPC or the CPA depending of course on whether the state is in the north or the states is in the south. You may have observed that we have included the Evidence Act under procedural criminal legislation. And that's because Miriam Webster's dictionary defines adjectival law as the portion of the law that deals with the rules of procedure governing evidence, pleadings, and practice. According to another legal source which we consulted, adjectival law pertains to and prescribes the practice, the method, the procedure, or legal machinery by which substantive law is enforced or made effective. In short, it prescribes the procedure for obtaining a decision according to substantive law. Modern jurists now prefer to use the term procedural law instead of adjectival law. So that's the, the correlation to the relationship between adjectival law and procedural law. Just as adjectives describe or modify nouns or pronouns, Adjectival law modifies how substantive law is enforced or made effective. In fact, the role that the Evidence Act plays is trying to create a level playing ground for the prosecution and the defense in the criminal case. So it amends the procedure or affects the procedure. Our third source is English procedural criminal legislation. We already treated this when we treated the other classification type. So the whatever we said there applies here with equal force. It shows that this is a different way of looking at the classification of the sources of criminal litigation. Let's take a look at the laws and rules applicable to criminal litigation in the various parts of Nigeria. In Northern Nigeria, we have the 1989 Constitution as amended, the Administration of Criminal Justice Law, ACJL, if the ACJA has been domesticated, or the Criminal Procedural Code Law, CPCL, if the ACJA hasn't been domesticated, the procedural rules of the respective courts in the various northern states, the magistrate court laws of the respective northern states, subject matter specific criminal laws, as well as offender type specific criminal laws such as the young, the children and young persons acts and laws of the respective states. For Southern Nigeria, we have the 1989 Constitution as amended, the Administration of Criminal Justice Law, if the ACJA has been domesticated, or the Criminal Procedural Law, CPL, if the ACJA hasn't been domesticated, the procedural rules of the respective courts in the various Southern states, magistrate court laws of the respective states, subject matter specific criminal laws, and offender type specific criminal laws such as the children and young persons laws of the respective states. And for all of Nigeria we have the 1999 constitution as amended, the Armed Forces Act, the Federal High Court Act and Rules, the Court of Appeal Act and Rules, the Supreme Court Act and Rules, as well as the ACJA. Let's take a look at the 
laws and rules applicable to criminal litigation in various courts in Nigeria. Federal courts first. In the federal court, we have the 1999 constitution as amended. The statutes establishing the courts, such as the Federal High Court Act, the Court of Appeal Act, the Supreme Court Act, etc. You also have the procedural rules guiding the operations of the respective federal courts. For state courts in, the, in Northern Nigeria, we have the 1999 Constitution as amended, the procedural rules guiding the operations of the respective Northern courts, either the ACGL if domesticated, or the CPCL if not, if the ACGL JA has not been domesticated, the magistrate court laws of those states, and finally, for the state courts in southern Nigeria, we have the 1999 constitution as amended, the procedural rules guiding the operation of the respective southern states, either the ACJL if the state has domesticated the same, or the CPL if the ACJA wasn't domesticated, and then the magistrate court laws of those states. So we now have our take-home assignment, comparing and contrasting the laws and rules applicable to various courts in Nigeria. Basically, there are two, a minimum of two laws that are applicable to criminal legislation or litigation in the various courts on the screen. The question is, what two laws regulate procedure at the Federal High Court? What two laws regulate procedure at the AFCT High Court? What two laws regulate procedure at the various state high courts? What two laws regulate procedure at magistrate courts? What two laws regulate procedure at the court martial? So that's our take home assignment. If you have followed the lecture so far, it should not be an impossible task to fulfill. With that, we are done with part two of this lecture. Part three is entitled types of criminal courts. The first classification scheme lists the courts as the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal, Federal, State and HCT High Courts are treated together, and finally the lower courts. Let's begin with the Supreme Court. Established by Section 230 of the 1999 Constitution as amended, constituted by its head, the Chief Justice of Nigeria, and such number of justices as may be prescribed by an act of the National Assembly, this is Nigeria's highest court and has been so since 1963 when Nigeria made it clean break from the British judicial system. Until its establishment, the highest court in Nigeria was the Federal Supreme Court. The now abolished Federal Supreme Court was not a final arbiter since appeals from it went to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. Our next court is the Court of Appeal. Established by Section 237, Subsection 1 of the 1999 Constitution as amended, initially by the Court of Appeal Decree, now Act No. 43 of 1976, 
and the Constitution Amendment Decree now Act No. 42 of 1976. It is constituted by its head, the President of the Court of Appeal, and a number of other justices, not less than 49, provided that not less than three shall be learned in Islamic personal law, and not less than three shall be learned in customary law. This is the second highest court of the land and also serves as an intermediate court between the Supreme Court on the one hand and the High Court on the other hand. The next set of courts is the Federal, State and Entity High Courts. The reason for considering these courts together is that they have equivalent powers and ranking. The Federal High Court was established by Section 249 of the 1989 Constitution as amended. It is formerly known as the Federal Revenue Court, which was established in 1973. They renamed the Federal High Court with the 1999 Constitution. The State High Court is established by Section 270, Subsection 1 of the 1989 Constitution as amended. This and the various high court laws of those states control its operation. The High Court of the ACT is established by Section 255, Subsection 1 of the 1989 Constitution as amended. By virtue of Section 252, Subsection 1 of the 1989 Constitution as amended, the Federal High Court is basically equivalent to the High Court of the state. The Federal High Court is constituted by its head, the Chief Judge of the Federal High Court, plus such number of judges as the National Assembly prescribed in its Enabling Act from time to time. While State High Courts are constituted by its head, a Chief Judge, plus such number of judges, as the State House of Assembly may prescribe in its enabling law from time to time. The High Court of the FCT is constituted by its head, a Chief Judge, plus such number of judges as the National Assembly prescribes in its enabling law from time to time. Let's take a look at the lower courts. These include area courts, postman courts, magistrate courts, and sharia courts. Magistrate courts are established by the magistrate court laws of their respective states. While area and sharia courts were established by the area court edict of 1967. In some northern states, these are known as sharia courts. In other northern states, these are known as area courts. Customary courts are established by the respective state laws as well. With that, we are done with the first classification scheme that is based on type the name of the courts. We propose another classification scheme and that is court with original general criminal jurisdiction, court with original special criminal jurisdiction, Courts with appellate criminal jurisdiction, courts with worldwide criminal jurisdiction. Let's take them one by one. Courts with original general criminal jurisdiction. These are courts in which one can commence criminal proceedings at first instance. Courts empowered to hear all cases that are not specifically reserved for courts of special jurisdiction at first instance. Courts empowered to conduct trial into a case involving parties without discrimination or limitation and over a wide range of subject matters. These include magistrate courts in the north, magistrate courts in the south, high courts in the north, 
and high cuts in the cell. We also have courts with original special criminal jurisdiction. These are courts in which a particular class of individuals can be tried for criminal misdeeds at first instance. Courts in which a particular class of criminal omissions or commissions, actual or suspected, can be tried at first instance. Courts empowered to conduct a hearing of a case involving a controlled list of potential parties and or over a limited or specific range of subject matters. These include area or sharia courts in the north, customary courts in the south, federal high court when trying criminal matters, juvenile courts which tries young persons, court martial which try members of the forces, coroner's courts which conducts inquests into the causes of death, and any other tribunals. Let's take one of the types, area courts and sharia courts. By virtue of section 24 of the area court edict of 1967, it restricts area and sharia courts from trying offenses punishable by death. That's subject matter jurisdiction. The jurisdiction of our offenders at the area and sharia court is limited to any person whose parents were members of any tribes indigenous to some parts of Africa or their descendants, any person, any of whose parents was a member of a tribe indigenous to Africa, and a person who, while not falling among the two categories above, consents to be tried by the court. Subject matter jurisdiction is as conferred by warrant or by law. The juvenile court's jurisdiction includes all young persons aged 14 and above and under 18, except the youth is charged jointly with an adult, in which case the juvenile court is robbed of its jurisdiction, or the youth is charged with culpable homicide. We'll now be moving on to the Federal High Court. Sections 251, subsection 1, 2, and 3 of the 1999 Constitution as amended lists the extent and limits of the subject matter jurisdiction of the Federal High Court. This legislation needs to be considered side by side with the following cases to grasp the extent and limits of the jurisdiction of the Federal High Court, as this is a favorite for examiners. Abbas vs. Commissioner of Police is 1988 case. Alhaji Mandara vs. Attorney General of the Federation, 1984 case. Running Motors Limited vs. Women Bank PLC, an, a 1983 case. Easy vs. the Federal Republic of Nigeria, a 1987 case. Savannah Bank vs. Pan Atlantic Shipping and Transport Agencies Limited, which is in 19. 1887 case. We are now done with the Federal High Court. We will now be considering court martials. This court is endowed with two types of jurisdiction. Subject matter jurisdiction is as provided for in sections 45 to 103 of the Armed Forces Act and broadly includes military and civil offenses. Offender jurisdiction is as provided for in section 130 of the Armed Forces Act. By offender jurisdiction is meant persons subject to service law. But see also a Latin G versus the state, a 2003 case. This is another examiner favorite. Now the sort of questions to expect include the types of court martial, the composition of the various types, the roles of each official in the various court martials, the rules governing procedure, who can be appointed a member, who can head and who cannot head a court martial, the quorum that needs to be formed, conditions to be made before an officer can be tried, who can convene the two types of court martial, whether the power to convene can be delegated, who is subject to its jurisdiction and who is not, 
When can it impose the death sentence? The difference between the two types of court martial, triable offenses. Can an ordinary court try a case already tried by a court martial and vice versa? On the screen you can see a picture of the Federal High Court. Another picture of a court martial. Now let us move on to the next classification subtype. Courts with appellate criminal jurisdiction. These are courts which can hear criminal cases on appeal. Courts empowered to hear criminal cases following or after their determination by either a court with original general criminal jurisdiction or a court with original special criminal jurisdiction or both. Courts empowered to review a trial court's proceedings for error. These include high courts in the north and high courts in the south, the high court of the FCT, the court of appeal and the supreme court. High courts in the north, these exercise appellate jurisdiction with respect to all appeals from magistrate courts and upper area or Sharia courts. It see section 272 sub 2 of the 1989 constitution as amended, the subject to section 251 of the 1989 constitution as amended. High courts in the south, which exercise appellate jurisdiction with respect to all appeals from magistrate courts, see section 272 sub 2 of the 1989 constitution as amended, which is subject to section 251 of the 1989 constitution as amended. High court of the FCT, this, is a, this, this exercises appellate jurisdiction with respect to all appeals from magistrate courts, see section 257 subsection 2 of the 1989 constitution as amended, be subject to section 251 of the 1989 constitution as amended. We also have the Court of Appeal which has no original criminal jurisdiction. The only appellate criminal jurisdiction with respect to the decisions of the following the Federal High Court, the FCT High Court, State High Courts, Court Marshals, any other tribunals established by the National Assembly. We see section 240 of the 1989 constitution as amended. We also have the Supreme Court, which has no original criminal jurisdiction. But the only appellate criminal jurisdiction with respect to the, the, the decisions of the Court of Appeal. The only limitation being the powers of the President in the case of the Federation or the Governor in the case of the State to grant prerogative of mercy as contained in section 235 of the 1989 constitution as amended and section 233 of the 1989 constitution as amended. On the screen is a picture of the Court of Appeal which we have just considered has appellate criminal jurisdiction. This is followed by a picture of the Supreme Court, which I've also discussed, has appellate criminal jurisdiction in respect of the decisions of the Court of Appeal. Our last type of court is the International Criminal Court. This court has jurisdiction over individuals and not states. He tries to hold such persons accountable for the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole, namely the crime of genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the crime of aggression. This is the end of the third part of this course.
We have now begun the concluding part of the course, key concepts to bear in mind. We will treat three subtopics, just as are shown on the screen. Sitting, setting, and comparing sitting and setting. Sitting of a court. According to Black Law Dictionary Free Online Legal Edition, The sitting of a court is the holding of a court with full form and before all the judges. The holding of a court of Nisi priors by one or more of the judges of a superior court. Plainly speaking, the sitting of a court refers to what days the court can validly conduct proceedings, also called juridical days. Mondays to Fridays are juridical days, although Saturday can could, under certain conditions, be a juridical day. Sundays and public holidays are non-juridical days. See section 40 of the Magistrate Court Law of Lagos State and section 52 of the High Court Law of Lagos State. Exceptions to the general rule of the court sitting on juridical days include 1. If the parties consent and the authority for those is also, Sami vs. Commission of Police is a 1952 case. 2. If there is a statutory backing for sitting on a non juridical day, see Fala A vs. Obasanjo. 3. If a case will inadvertently adjourn to a public holiday, Fala A vs. Obasanjo. 4. If the court needs to sit to hear matters of remand, bail, non custodial dispositions, However, this is limited to Saturdays. See section 40, subsection 2 of the Magistrate Court's Law of Lagos States. Here are a few other points to take note of. The effect of a court sitting on a non juridical day is that the proceedings are rendered a nullity. And the authority for this is also Sunny versus the Commissioner of Police, the 1952 case we have earlier discussed. Two, the effect of a statute prescribing a time frame for disposing of a criminal trial is that such a statutory provision is unconstitutional. AG on those states versus AG of the Federation, that's a 2002 case. In Nigeria, a court starts sitting at 9 a.m. and stops sitting at 4 p.m. Or in the alternative, whenever the court rises for that day. We are now done with sitting of the court for proceedings. We will now switch on to setting of a court. So, what is the setting of a court? The setting of a court refers to the physical layout of the courtroom and is composed of the following the bench which is where the judge or magistrate sits the registrar's desk which is where the registrar or other court clerks sits the bar which is where lawyers are permitted to sit in the Supreme Court and Court of Appeal and High Court of the and High Courts, such lawyers must be mandatorily be robed. In the Magistrate Court, robing is discretionary. See Rule 45 of the Rules of Professional Conduct. Two kinds of bar exist: the inner bar and the outer bar. The inner bar is for attorney general, live benchers, most of the body of benchers and sons. The outer bar is for all other lawyers. If the design of the court does not accommodate an inner or outer bar, 
then the first row will substitute as the inner bar. We also have the dock, which is where the accused stands or sits during trial. While in the dock, the accused can only make non-evidential statements since it cannot be cross-examined on the same while in the dock. It is situated to the left of the judge. We also have the witness box, which is where witnesses stand to give evidence. The police see also sections 205 and 208 of the Evidence Act. It is situated to the right of the judge. For an accused to make evidential statements and be subject to being cross-examined on the same, he must be within the witness box. Finally, we have a gallery, which is where those interested in but not participating in court proceedings stay to observe the same. Sitting and setting compared. Sitting refers to the days that the court can validly conduct proceedings, while setting refers to the physical layout of the court room. The next three slides contain source material for the history of Nigerian substantive and procedural criminal legislation. This first one was by Alan Gladehill. The second one was written by H. F. Morris. And this third one was written by H. F. Morris also. The rest are picture credits for the other pictures in this lecture. The Federal High Court, the Court Mar the Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court, the International Criminal Court, the setting of a court. Thank you for listening to this lesson.